Well, you're going to be so blessed, and I think some of you may be even shocked at uh, what our guest is going to share with you today. Uh, Rick and Kay Warren are two of the most notable people in the Christian world. He wrote a book, Joni, called The Purpose Driven Life, mm -hmm. that other than the Bible has probably sold more copies than any book that I'm aware of, any Christian book, 30 million copies. They pastor one of the largest churches in America, Saddleback Church in Southern California, over 25,000 people a week. And you would look at somebody like that and think, well, they have a perfect life. They've never had a problem. They've never had any troubles. They've never had any difficulties. But you need to stay tuned because Kay Warren is here to share from her new book entitled Sacred Privilege, Your Life and Ministry as a Pastor's Wife. So let's welcome Kay Warren. So, being a pastor's wife is kind of like being the first lady. You're really like the first lady of that church, and everybody expects you to be perfect. You can't ever have a bad hair day. You can't have a <laughs> run in your stockings. You can't ever get mad or lose your cool. Is that true? Is that what most people expect of pastor's wives? You know, I sad to say there is a lot of that. I mean, <laughs> I grew up in a pastor's home. My dad was a pastor. So I, I was aware from a very early age that people had an expectation as a pastor's kid. I had to know all the answers. Or, and there were things I was supposed to do because I was the pastor's kid and things I was not supposed to do because I was the pastor's kid. So, yeah, there's huge expectations. So, Kay, growing up, did you ever see anybody being mean to your mom or dad? Oh. Or hear about them being mean to them? You know, I, there are some Wednesday night business prayer, me prayer meetings that are indelibly marked in my mind as where my dad was working his heart out, loving the people, and there was opposition from small-minded church members. And actually, my dad, when he left the ministry in um, his 50s, he was a little burned out. He wow. had worked his whole life, loved Jesus, loved the church, and uh, the pressure and the criticism really got to him. So I, I witnessed it firsthand. You know, a lot of people don't realize, uh, and I don't know what the accurate statistics are, but supposedly... Every year, there are tens of thousands of ministers who lead the ministry. And it is because of the pressure. It is because of being burnt out. So many of them end up making poor choices just because they're constantly under attack. They're giving, giving, giving. And a lot of times, they don't take time out to receive as much as they should. And heart attacks, high blood pressure, nervous breakdowns, alcoholism, pornography, uh, adultery, all kind of things like that, and not excusing any of those choices because it's still their choice, but many times there are extenuating circumstances. I want us to go by way of video, and I want you to see Rick and Kay in action together. They're like Batman and Robin. <laughs> so let's go to Saddleback Church in Southern California and watch them minister together. you got to make choices. Boy, you just kind of went all over the place with that. So <laughs> what I was saying And was what I was continuing to say. No. About differences is you have heard Rick say this, and we'll say it again, we are so different. Yeah. I mean, if there was a category of so different, we would fall into the so different category. In every way we are different. And in a relationship, that's one of the things that causes people to lose some of the great loving feelings they have is because they don't know what to do with the differences. Um, I mean, we are, he's an extrovert, I'm an introvert. He is um, spontaneous and impulsive, and I am a planner. He's big picture, I am detail. I mean, there's been this piece of fuzz on your shirt that I have meant to take off this entire... I don't see it. Well, I know, but I it's, it's back here, so it's been driving it. me, it's been bugging me this whole time. Um, <laughs> he exaggerates... Have you, he exaggerates, and I'm very precise. Um, you know, he... I'm Tigger. Eeyore. She's the Eeyore. Yeah, he's That's a dreamer. Exactly right. I'm a pragmatist. I mean, exactly. it is a wonder that we have made it 39 years because of our differences. But what that has required from us is acceptance. Let me tell you something. All of you men can say a big amen. Without our wives, most of us would be a whole lot worse than we are. Joni, some of that was reminding me of you. 
Well, and some of the things she said about him was reminding me. <laughs> oh, of can, can I get that good. piece of lint off your coat while we're yes, yes, Yeah, I here. probably have a bunch of lint. Yeah. Anyway, you know what I love about your book, Kay, is your transparency. And I know that's one of the things that's really important to you is that for people who are in ministry, for people who are leading, it's important that we be transparent to the people that we minister to. And they understand that there was only one who ever walked this earth who had perfection. We all make mistakes. Um, we all have flaws, feet of clay, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, for so long, people have put people in ministry up on a pedestal and many have fallen down. Well, we're not meant to live there. That's, yeah. that's the problem. We're not meant, God never intended us. Maybe that's the way it happens in a lot of churches, but that's mm -hmm. not God's intent. And we don't have to stay there. I, probably that'd be the most important thing I'd say is, yes, there may be that expectation, but you don't have to stay there. We're not, we can't walk on water in the ministry. We can't live on that teetering pedestal, and we aren't meant to live in this, this constricting box of perfectionism. We are human. The apostles said in Acts, they said, we're just mere men like you. We're just human beings. Yeah. And so for us, one of the things that, one of the reasons that I know we're going to last in ministry no matter what happens to us is because we've made a decision that we're not going to live on that pedestal. Yeah. And I encourage so all, of your, all of your um, viewers, anyone who's in ministry, to get down off of that pedestal, come out of that box of perfectionism. Like you said, Joni, there's been only one perfect one, and his name is Jesus. All I can do is be a person sold out to Jesus Christ, love him with my whole heart, work on my character, try to become more Christ-like, right. but not try to pretend that I'm perfect, that I have all the answers. And you know what? What happens when, when we live in that place is the parishioners think that the minister then is supposed to do all the work because they're the paid professionals. But Ephesians tell us that it's the work of the ministers mm -hmm. to equip other ministers to do the work. So when yes. we refuse to be perfect and when we equip other saints to do the ministry, everybody's free to kind of run in the lane that God has made us to run in. Well, our viewers see my humanity on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Joni has a tremendous teaching she does at women's conferences about expectations. And Joni, when people expect the pastor and the pastor's wife to be perfect, and then they find out they're not, mm -hmm. a lot of times because they have unrealistic expectations, they just get devastated, don't they? Yeah, there's a, a, a dear mentor of mine, Bunny Wilson, um, taught this principle to me. And she said, I remember one day I was vacuuming and I was mad at the whole family because I didn't feel like anybody appreciated me. And I was doing everything, taking care of everybody. Nobody said thank you. And she said that um, she was standing there and the Lord said, who are you doing it for? And she said, well, I'm doing it for all my family. And he said, no, everything you do should be as unto me. And when you do it, unto me, then you have no expectation from anyone else because people are always going to disappoint you. And when you have an expectation in a husband, when you have an expectation in a wife and a coworker and a family member, they're gonna disappoint you. So who is your expectation? Who do you have your expectation in? Where does my help come from? It comes from the Lord. So, you know, I was thinking about the fact that you are so transparent in the book and I wanna hear some of your personal story but haven't you found that through that transparency that you've actually been able to help more people? Yeah, Rick has, I, I learned this from Rick. He said people are, are helped more by our weaknesses than by our strengths. I know that when I read, you know, a book of um, someone that someone's written or I hear the story or testimony, I, I am more encouraged when I hear that somebody's failed and found God's grace and started again than I am by somebody who never ever talks about their problems who never shares a hurt or a wound or a doubt or an insecurity. So if that's what helps me, I figure that's what's gonna help the people in our church. So Rick and I have been very honest through the years about how difficult our marriage has been, particularly in those beginning years when we didn't know how to communicate, we didn't know what to do with our differences. Did y'all ever fuss and fight? Oh my goodness, we <laughs> fought about the way we fought, you know? <laughs> so not only did we argue, oh, no. but we argued about how we argued. Um, still can get caught there because we're just humans who are on a journey, on a path, and we don't have this sanctification thing completely down yet. Well, the book is Sacred Privilege, Your Life and Ministry as a Pastor's Wife. You know what I feel like right now? This come to me, I'm sure, by the Holy Spirit. Every person watching should get a copy today for your pastor's wife and then write a little inscription 
and tell her how much she means to you, that you love her and you're praying for her. Kay, one of the things you talk about in the book, and I was just shocked, I couldn't even believe it, but as a young girl, you had something really terrible happen to you, and as a result, it opened up something in you that caused other uh, difficult things to happen. Are, are you willing to, I know you shared in the book, are you willing to talk about that for Absolutely. just a moment with all these people? Absolutely. What you're referring to is I was molested when I was very young, and didn't tell anybody, didn't know what to say, didn't even wow. know how to express it. But from that stirred some sexual curiosity, curiosity in sexuality and in, in pornography. And um, I was so torn and conflicted because on one hand, I loved Jesus with all my heart. I was a good girl. I keep telling myself, I'm a good girl. How can I be attracted to pornography? You have to realize it was a very different time. There wasn't the availability that there is of pornography 24 seven now. It was mostly in magazine form. So I didn't see it that often, but when I did, there was, um, I was fascinated and repelled and it created this huge conflict within me. I didn't know how to talk about it. I didn't know how to even tell anybody I was struggling. Um, I think one of the things that have come from my own struggles is to just to say to other people, we all struggle. Don't struggle alone. I struggled alone. And it was, as a result, it just grew in importance. It grew in its power on me. And when Rick and I got married, um, I told him right before we got married that I had been molested. But because I was so unemotional about it, didn't realize the impact, he didn't, he was pretty naive. He didn't know it was a problem. So when we got married and sex didn't work, again, we argued about how sex didn't work and why it didn't work and what was wrong with us. And again, we didn't know who to talk to. We were in ministry. He was a youth pastor. Wow. Who do we tell that our marriage is in a shambles, that that nothing about it is right, that, that I've got um, um, an attraction to pornography that I don't know what to do with. And through that, um, of, of God meeting me and in confession and in, um, in being able to, to share that with an, another trusted Christian friend and work through steps of, of recovery myself, um, I can tell everyone who might today be sitting there and nobody has an idea that pornography has a hold in your life. You know, nobody knows it when they're talking to you, but you know it. And I can tell you that there is hope and that there is help Thank and that God. there is a recovery and there is, um, there is hope for something being different within you. But you have to talk about it. You have to tell it. You have to let somebody in. And um, I, I highly recommend Celebrate Recovery. We, we, over 2 million people have gone through this Christian 12-step program that, is, that we started at Saddleback because every one of us has something. Everybody has a hurt, a habit, a hang-up and recovery is possible. I think one of the keys you said is that you have to shine the light on it. As long as you keep it in the darkness, right. it will it overtake has power. you. It, it has, has power, power in the darkness. It does, it really does. So if, today, if you're watching and you can relate to some of the things we're talking about, maybe you're struggling, you don't have to tell us your specific struggle, but just call and it we today. would, ne Even if you do, we yeah. would never tell it over the air or identify who was saying it. I just wanna say, I know that many of you like me, so appreciate Kay being willing to share something like that. Let me just tell you this, most people I know would not do it. They would either be ashamed or they'd be afraid that somebody would judge them or think of them in a negative light. And her sole purpose is to help people. I wanna put up a picture of a young man by the name of Matthew. We know that's a great name, it's in the Bible. And Kay, before you tell us what happened to Matthew, tell us who Matthew was. Matthew was, uh, is my youngest son. Um, somebody creative, passionate, funny, deeply compassionate, uh, caring for people who struggle. Matthew had mental illness from the time he was um, very young. He was diagnosed with, de with depression when he was seven and he would have been diagnosed sooner if I had known that children can have a mental illness. I didn't know. I just thought he was different. I thought the things that he did and his behavior, he would outgrow it. I had no idea that he was mentally ill. And um, through um, his life, he lived a pretty tortured existence. He struggled with suicidal thoughts from the time he was 12. Oh, um, goodness. Every, almost every <laughs> diagnosis in um, OCD, um, major depression, um, bipolar disorder, borderline personality, he lived with, with it all. And um, when he was 27, um, I say that, you know, he hit that mental illness wall for the last time. And um, 
He didn't really want to die, and he would tell me that. But he said, I just want the pain to stop. Wow. I just want the pain to stop. And on April 5th, uh, 2013, was the day that for him, he couldn't live with the pain any longer, didn't see any options, didn't see any hope for change, and um, he took his life. And um, obviously, it was uh, our worst nightmare. It's the hardest thing in the world to lose a child, and to lose a child to suicide is, uh, is devastating. And we said uh, on the day that Matthew died, we are devastated, but we are not destroyed. We will not let <coughs> mental illness win. We will not let um, that devastation take us down as well. And as strange as it might seem, now, you know, almost four years later, I actually have more hope than I've ever had. I'm more convinced that God is good. He is good and what he does is good. Yes. Matthew's death is not good, but, um, but God is good and I trust him even with, with this devastating loss. It has led us to talk to the church in particular about mental illness, that it's real, that it's common, that it's treatable, that there's hope. Um, it's caused us to talk about suicide 44,000 people took their lives last year in the United States, more than twice as many suicides than murders. Um, about every 14 seconds, somebody in the United States takes their life. My goodness. And it's one of the last <clears throat> taboos for us to talk about in the church. I mean, we're getting to where we can talk about mental illness and acknowledge that it's real, but there are still people that don't want to talk about suicide. And I hear them, sometimes they'll come up and they'll whisper to me, my father died of suicide, my, my sister, my mother, and we don't talk about it. And we decided we're going to talk about it because there is hope, there is help, yes. and we're, we're going to talk about it. Three quick comments. Number one, so many people don't realize that mental illness is just as real as cancer or high blood pressure. And so Christians particularly won't talk about it because there's shame associated with it or there's disbelief from others because they just think all oh, it's all in your head. Sometimes it's a chemical imbalance. You wouldn't be ashamed to talk about, hey, I've got high blood pressure. Right. I'm having to take this medicine That's every right. month. And then number two, psychologists say that the most devastating thing that can ever happen is for a child to precede them in death. And then finally, number three, most Christians, and it's getting better, have automatically assumed that if somebody commits suicide that they're going to die and go to hell. Well, let me ask you a question. Do you think that the righteous judge is less fair than a worldly judge? Even in our country, innocent by reason of insanity. If somebody has got mental problems, then they are not held to the responsibility for what they did. Do you think a loving God would be any less fair and righteous in his judgments? So today, I want you to get that out of your mind. Yeah, there probably are some people that'll commit suicide and die and go to hell, but there's a lot of them that won't because to do that probably means you're not in your right mind, and you're not making a good decision. Well, and if anybody who is a believer in Jesus Christ, we can't take ourselves out of his hands. That's right. In John 10, Jesus said, nothing can pluck you. No one, That's no right. man can pluck you out of my hand. So anybody who is a believer in Jesus Christ is safe in his hands. So I, I love what you just said about a worldly judge and our God is our judge. But there's even Jesus' word in John yes. 10 that no one, not even our own actions, can remove us from the security of Jesus. And you know, that should give many of you others hope about other things. You've got problems, you've got habits, you've got uh, temptations, and you beat yourself up about it. God doesn't say, I give you grace so you can just live any kind of way you want. But God says that if you ask him into your heart and you accept him as your savior, then he's the one that gave you the gift and nobody can take that gift away because it's an eternal gift. The book today is Sacred Privilege, Your Life in Ministry as a Pastor's Wife. And Kay talks about these things in this book. 
And this will not only help people that are pastors' wives, but any lady out there, you're going through difficulties, you're going through challenges, and you're thinking, how do I deal with it? How do I share, share this? How do I get the help that I need? This book would be great for any lady, but I really felt like the Holy Spirit spoke to me a while ago and said, if you love your pastor and his wife, buy a copy, write a little inscription to that pastor's wife, tell her how much you love her and that you're praying for her and how much she means to you, and then give it to her. You cannot imagine how meaningful that will be to her. Kay, thank you for being here today. Thank you for sharing about your life and Rick and about your family. And I hope many of you will get this book and read it. I don't read every book because I would all I could ever do would be read books and still couldn't read them all. But I'm going to read this one. Now, it may be about fourth or fifth on my list because I got others I've already committed to, but I will read it. I will read every word of it because I want to understand these things better myself. I want to be able to understand Joni better, so I'm going to read it. I hope you will read it too.